All right, thank you. Welcome everyone to the weekly TIC call. As always, uh, this is a public call. Anybody is welcome to listen in and uh, participate. There is two requirements to doing so. First one is to be aware and live by the antitrust policy, the notice of which is currently displayed. And the other one is the code of conduct, which basically requires that everybody behave respectfully like a decent human being. So with that taken care of, I'm happy to jump right into the agenda just uh, before we dive in. So, you know, um, you may have seen, we got a report from Aries. We had not had one in a while. That was an oversight. Uh, I'm sure this won't happen again. And we had a pretty good, interesting report with a set of questions, which I think, you know, go beyond the scope of Aries only. And so I thought this was worth putting them as general discussion topics rather than just, you know, keeping them as discussion for Aries. And, um, and so prior to that, we'll have a, a presentation from our staff members, David and Rai, on the uh, contribution campaign. So, uh, right, there was this announcement in the agenda. I know David created the agenda. I think it was a copy over from last week. Is there anything new or is it just a reminder so that everybody knows? I yeah. think this is a copy paste. Yeah. But, That's what I thought, but. but same thing, um, you know, just replay the last week's, you know. Yeah, it remains relevant. So I was like, well, I can leave it there as a good reminder. Is there any other announcement anybody wants to make at this point? No, all right. If not, then we can go ahead. So as I was saying, we received a report from the ARIES project. Um, other than the two questions that were actually highlighted by uh, Stephen in the report, um, do is there any questions from the TSC? They send a pretty comprehensive report. Um, they have a, what it looks to me like a very healthy project with contributions and implementations in many different ways, including uh, uses outside of Hyperledger, which is great. So if there isn't, then we can- No, uh, Arnaud, this is Angelo. Maybe yeah. I, I would like to take the chance because I also, um, I, I found it interesting that uh, RS was used also outside our ledger. So the, and I, and I was thinking that apart, apart the presentation about uh, tech, tech, this technical presentation that we are having, it would be interesting also if the project, someone from the, from the projects come and tell us about success story. Uh, the way the project has been used, uh, I don't know, in production or to solve a real world problem um, that, that I would find very interesting personally. That's a good point. And uh, maybe, you know, this is uh, one of the projects. I mean, Stephen, in case you, you, I think you do know because you participate in those calls. You know, we've, we're now welcoming presentations that are more, a bit more like, you know, gives us an opportunity to have a deeper dive into each project. And uh, if somebody from the ARIES project uh, were willing to do that, I think that could be a, that could be a good topic. And uh, as part of that presentation, you could indeed highlight the kind of uses that are being done outside of Hyperledger and the industry in general that are kind of like in production to address uh, Angelo's point. Um, we'd be glad up. to do that. <clears throat> Um, Sam's here as well, um, Nathan as well, um, I'm sure, and Troy is here as well, so I'm glad to do that. It is certainly a popular topic these days with some sort of worldwide pandemic going on. Yeah, I realize that. All right, so let's try and schedule that for some future call, which, you know, whenever it is convenient for you guys. We have two people with hands up. All right, let's go to the queue. Arun. Hey, thanks for the opportunity. So um, on the Aries, hello. Hello. Yeah, go ahead, we hear you. Oh, okay, sorry. Um, my mic showed a red mark. Uh, so yeah, on, on the Aries, right? So I was in fact working through some of the examples. Uh, okay, 
Now I don't hear him anymore. Am I the no, one either. off? No, yeah, no, I, you're no. not. Okay. I, I think we lost him. Uh, Dano? No. Yeah. That's so good. some of this discussion is put for later down in the question, but I guess I have one question for Aries. Are there any incubation statuses they don't meet? Do they meet all of them? Um, I'd be interested to know which ones they don't, because this is also kind of a pit for that all incubation products, projects. I would like them to see them reflect on the incubation statuses in their quarterly reports. So at least they're aware of what needs to happen next, if anything. Yeah, I think the big, um, the big issue with Aries is that because it's such a decentralized project, if you will, um, there's so many different sub projects um, that that we haven't come together. But I think at least two and probably three of the frameworks within Aries meet all of the incubation requirements. Um, so uh, we could definitely go down that list and produce that back to the TSC if that's the question. But the the more Interesting one is just this, um, because it's not a single thing, um, it, it becomes harder to say, well, you know, if you go incubation and then you go look at one of the frameworks and it's nowhere near ready, uh, nowhere near a production use, how, how does that get conveyed? And that's, that's been the tricky part and, and probably why no one has stepped up to say, oh, well, we should be out of incubation uh, we should be active, um, but I think we should be active. I think we've far exceeded the the bar set for active, and that's well. And question. and to add a little bit more of the historical context here, the idea when we split apart areas from Indy was that we would do some library refactoring on the libraries that that for um, cryptographic information exchange that came out of Indy, and a lot of those library refactoring efforts either didn't happen or didn't happen the way we expected meaning the frameworks that were written in Go and in Python and in .NET took on a bigger role inside of Aries and uh, used the Rust libraries, the common Rust libraries a little bit differently than we thought when we first started the project. And so the projects matured and got a lot more development effort more quickly than we expected, but also some of those you know, checklist tasks that we thought would happen early got pushed out towards later. Um, and now we, we are seeing those library factors um, come about and we're starting to see um, some of that effort uh, um, or some of those tasks get checked off. Um, but, but like what Steve, Steven said, they're not real, they didn't turn into the prerequisites towards stability that we thought they would be. Um, and so it's probably fair to say we are active um, in all the sense that we would normally consider for a Hyperledger project, but we haven't necessarily finished all of our goals in, in terms of a common core. Um, and this gets to that next question of, of protocol where we, we do have a common core in terms of everyone supports the same protocol and our inter, we could do interoperability testing and compatibility between all the frameworks. It just didn't happen the way we thought it would have. All right, so let me stop you, the discussion right there. I mean, I appreciate this and I want us to spend some quality time discussing those points, but uh, I put them on the agenda for later. I would like to switch to the part, to the presentation uh, part of the agenda, and then we can go back to those questions. I do agree with Dino that I would, I think it would be interesting for you guys to actually look at the exit criteria from incubation and see where, you know, where you stand because I think there is some disconnect there, which hopefully we can clarify in the discussion for later. So is there any other questions other than those major points which we'll get back to? Hey, sorry, before I, um, I got dropped, ah, I guess, sorry. I, yes. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, quick question. So on the Aries front, I, I see um, different frameworks, right? And just from the documentation perspective for somebody who would like to start using it, I guess there is inconsistency in terms of how different agents work. Um, if, if not, um, I, only the, con I mean, the APIs which are exposed, some of the functionality as well. So would, would it be nice to document or have a separate repository which says, hey, here is the, um, the common goal which any of the ARIS agent would support? 
and if you have a need for you to use SDK, then this, this is how you would use. Or if you want to just use it as, let's say, a component which sits in between your controller and the actual um, uh, blockchain layers, then start using this for this specific blockchain. Is, can, are there any plans of organizing those kind of things? The short answer is that's already there. Um, we can go into a lot of detail, but uh, I'll defer. But short answer is that is there. May not be easily found, um, obviously, if you haven't found it, but um, it's there. All right. So okay. if you on the side, maybe in the chat, can point Arun to the right documentation, I think that would be good. All right. Thank you. Let's get to the presentation on the contribution campaign, shall we? I will uh, hand the floor over to David. Hello, are you able to hear me? Yes, we are. So for a little bit of context, this is an idea that came up at Global Forum last year. Uh, um, a number of people were involved in the idea, Tracy, uh, Jess, Rai, I, uh, you know, and others. And we've also been talking about it, you know, on and off over this last year at the developer relations call that happens every month. Um, and we did want to up-level this a little bit and share it out because we did reach a, a, a milestone. Last year, we came up with the idea. We wanted to run a pilot to see if there are ways that we could help boost the number of contributors that are getting connected into projects. And we did just complete a pilot. We presented that information at the DevRel call. And again, just wanted to uh, share this with you. So let me share my screen real quick. Are you able to see my screen? Yes. Great. So I'll just go through this quickly. Uh, uh, if there are questions, that's great. Uh, um, so I didn't want to take a ton of time, but just to go through quickly. As a starting point, I just want to point out that the new uh, uh, insights tool that provides a lot of metrics for the community, which we haven't really had until recently, is a really great resource. I encourage everybody to go check it out. We did pull some information from there around just the level, the number of contributors over the last 24 months. And it basically shows that things are flat. You know, there's a couple of dips in there, but those are just artifacts of the holidays when things are a little bit slower. If you look at the, the rolling average green line, you know, it, it just shows that things are, are relatively flat over the last 24 months. So the, the idea, again, of what we were trying to do last year was, can we take specific contribution opportunities and run a campaign around them that, you know, leverages all the best practices that we've learned uh, for how to market what's going on in Hyperledger and share that out and see if that makes a difference. You know, my observation is we haven't necessarily done that in the past. We've promoted getting involved in Hyperledger and contributing to Hyperledger in general, but, you know, you know, my, I was making an assumption and I think many of us were making an assumption that people, you know, have a hard time going from, okay, here's Hyperledger and how do I go from that to a specific contribution opportunity just because of the nature of the community where there could be a little bit of, you know, lack of clarity about like, okay, I get Hyperledger as an umbrella. There are all these different things happening, but how do I find a specific thing that meets my, you know, interest and, and skill levels? You know, we've got a bunch of different projects, a bunch of different labs, a bunch of different groups. So we, our thought was if we run a contribution campaign, very specific about these are, this is one of the things in the Hyperledger greenhouse, and these are the specific contribution opportunities, um, you know, that you can do there, you know, would that help connect people into, you know, contrib becoming a contributor. So that's what we did. We picked, uh, we talked to a number of different groups and the blockchain automation framework lab was just the one group that we uh, ended up moving forward with first in the pilot. So we, we've been working with the blockchain automation framework team uh, since the summer of last year. We helped them create a contribution landing page that really includes a number of different best practices about you know, what we thought would help easily create a pathway uh, and support for people to get in into that project and start contributing. And then we shared it on all the different Hyperledger channels that we have available to us. And Jess was a, a huge help here, helped us create a framework for, you know, what were the channels that we could use? How do we use them? You know, basically coming up with that campaign for us. And this included running meetups, using the Hyperledger website, the wiki, newsletters, emails, webinars, social. So basically, let's, the idea was with the test, let's try to put this information on all the different channels we have available to us 
you can see here for an example, uh, this image I'm showing is a promo that we put on both the Hyperledger website on the participate page and the wiki main page, just as an example of how we use those channels. And then we did that for a period of time over Q Q4. Uh, uh, and then there's some data that I'll show right after this to show you what the impact was. But I think the most important thing to share out you know, here today is that by doing this, we've created a number of assets that were used for this campaign that could be reused as templates for other campaigns. You know, and, and specifically that means that contribution landing page, I would encourage people to take a look at. There are again, a number of things we put in there that I think are helpful. Very clear instructions about how to get involved, you know, step-by-step, step, you know, a video. Uh, um, we embedded the good first issues into the landing page itself. You know, we wanted to make it as easy as possible for people to find those things. So, you know, remove some clicks for how to, you know, actually get connected to those opportunities. So anyway, that's an example of one, th an asset that could be used as a template, uh, reused as a template for other projects. And then the campaign itself, you know, Jess did put, a uh, you know, an example to together of how do you use Hyperlater's channels and that could again be reused by other people. So um, the intent was not to do this as a one-off, but the intent was to do this as a foundation for something that could be repeated. Um, and then just as far as the results go, I won't read this whole quote, but this was from the main point of contact at Accenture who was working with us on their side on the BATH team. And you can see here, they were very happy that they decided to do this campaign and they felt that this really catapulted uh, their open source uh, you know, pro you know, project in the community. Um, there's an appendix to this that goes into a little bit more of the details, but I'll, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll leave that to you to look at if you want to. I did just want to provide a few really high level results for what the analysis was show, showed about how the campaign worked. Um, in terms of new contributors, there were seven uh, non-Accenture contributors that showed up and started contributing during the campaign. These came from a, a variety of different organizations. Um, so it was really encouraging to see that not just the number of contributors, but also the kind of the, the diversity of contributors, you know, grew over that time. And then a couple of things that were really, that were very important to the team, you know, they were really wanting people not just to show up and contribute to an open issue, but they wanted them to actually get involved in the planning and the, you know, the dynamics of the community. So the, the, the blockchain automation framework team, when we asked them, what are the things that you looked at to see if the campaign was successful or not, they picked out these other two points. One was planning calls. Again, they wanted really, they wanted people, you know, to show up and take part in the discussions and the planning for the uh, project. And so before the campaign, Every now and then they saw a couple of new people show up on a call, but it wasn't consistent and there wasn't many, many, and there wasn't very many, but since September, they really have seen consistent uh, participation from several non-Accenture participants. So they really marked that as a sign of success. And then the chat channel. Um, yes, the number of people in the chat channel increased, but again, for the, uh, the core team that we were working with, what was, really an indicator of success for them was that questions, so more questions have been asked, you know, asked in the channel as more people showed up, but to them, the fact that answers were coming from other new con community members was a real sign of success for them. You know, it's not just the people, the initial people who started the project who was always answering questions, you know, they found it very satisfying that a new person who maybe had shown up a couple of months ago are now also answering questions to the to the newer people who are showing up. So this is just the takeaway that we got from the, the BAF team about what were the metrics that you know really stood out for you. So again, wanted to share that. And I think this was an indicator that you know we were able to you know use hyperledger channels to connect people into this specific contribution opportunity. Um, one thing that I think we could do to build on this beyond just reusing those templates that we created for other places, but I think one thing that would be maybe a phase two in this pilot that I think would again be something that we could turn into a template is I think now that people have shown up and started contributing, you know, it's really key in an open source project to recognize contributions. So one thing that came up as an idea uh, in this pilot that we we're working with that team on is they were really interested in issuing digital badges, which is something that has happened in other open source projects. So, you know, uh, this is something that we have not done yet, but I just wanted to share here with the TSC that this is an idea that's come up. And if there's a, 
uh, interest in doing a, a deeper dive into a, a discussion of what would a contributor badges for Hyperledger look like, we can come back and talk through that. Because when the BAP team asked about that, we did start to look into it and have started to put a plan together. So anyway, that's an idea. I think, you know, the idea for doing more with recognition is that, you know, it really incentivizes new people to show up if they're seeing something that seems like, oh, that'd be great. I'd like to earn that myself. And I think very importantly, it helps keep those people who did make that contribution involved. You know, if you show up at an open source community make a contribution and then nobody says thanks or nobody, you know, really acknowledges you, you can feel like, oh, maybe I didn't do anything that people thought was worthwhile. So, you know, I do think this recognition piece is a really important part uh, of, you know, this this campaign idea. And I think it's really hard to overinvest in recognition in an open source community because there really is a return on investment in doing it. So, you know, yes, we recognize people today, but would an additional layer of recognition in the community, you know, be worthwhile or not. So just to throw that out there, we can talk about digital badges. If people want to do a deeper dive on that, we can come back and look at what a plan would look like. Um, and then to talk about next steps, you know, we did start talking to a number of groups last year about doing a contribution campaign pilot and one other project is in the works. So later on uh, in Q1, we're wanting to do a campaign around uh, um, translating technical documentation. You know, the Hyperledger Fabric documentation team last year really started to work with more communities around the world to translate their materials. So they had initially had a Chinese translation. Now they have six or seven more additional translations based all from, you know, contributors in the community who showed up and wanted to do that. So we're putting a video together showcasing that work and could do a campaign around that uh, in a couple of months when the video is completed. And then Jess has recommended that maybe we do this on a quarterly basis. So you can see on here, we don't really know what Q2, Q3, or Q4 would look like. Although, you know, again, that's her recommendation that we do that. And I think, you know, from my point of view, you know, I think, you know, it would be great to do more of these. I think, you know, now that we have done this once, it will be easier to do this. And again, because again, we have these reusable templates. So I would be happy to help work with people on this as well. Uh, um, so what our thought on is next steps to kind of round out the schedule for the year is to go to the maintainer calls for different projects, share with them, you know, the idea of, you know, being able to run a contribution campaign and see if there is interest from others in doing this, you know, uh, I don't want to I don't want to make an assumption that there is, but it is something that we now can do it. it it's not going to be uh, that difficult, you know, I think there's an easy set of things that we can do to really, you know, highlight what those contribution opportunities are, and then we'll throw them into these channels using the, the process we've established. And then uh, again, we can do the same process. We can see, measure the success of those, build on, you know, what's working, tweak what's not working as well, and then, you know, maybe make this a very easy, repeatable process. So that was all I wanted to share. There are some additional things, just to be aware, if you want to take a look at the slides, there's an appendix that goes a little bit more into the details of what what we actually did in the campaign and some of the other metrics we saw. But this was more just a, a sharing uh, of what happened and see if there are any questions. All and right, Rye or Tracy, if I missed anything, please feel free to uh, add. Any questions for David? I see Mark has his hand up. Go yeah, ahead, you Mark. mentioned there were seven uh, new people for this effort. How many of them came from outside of Hyperledger versus, uh, act, you know, current members? It's a good question. I don't know, Rai, if we, did we break it down that way? I mean, that we could, we could go back and look at that to see if it's new, new to Hyperledger or just new to this lab, you know, that's I a good. I don't know. Uh, I, good question. I'd have to get the data. It's, it's not something that I have at hand. Sorry. Right, not that big a deal. I was just curious. But I think that is a good question. I, I, you know, since we haven't done this before, we didn't really know what were the most important metrics to look at. But if, if kind of new to Hyperledger contributors is worth breaking down, we can do that. All right. Anything else? 
I think it was pretty compelling stories so it should motivate other projects to want to take advantage of this. Yeah, and if, if other projects are interested, it's an open invitation. Feel free to reach out to Rai, to me, to Tracy. Yeah, I'd, I'd just add, you know, um, kudos to the staff, right? Uh, without the staff, we wouldn't have been able to do this. And so um, I think this has been a really great experience from the, the blockchain automation framework uh, group. Um, and, you know, I highly recommend, right? Like the staff is there to help us. And um, this is one of the ways that they can help us. So if you um, are thinking about how do you get more contributors, uh, this is definitely a, a good way to, to approach it. And, um, yeah, thank you, I guess is all I have to say. Great, well, I'm glad to hear it was a positive experience. Sounds good. All right, so if there is no further questions, I suggest we jump right back into those discussion points we started uh, touching on earlier with regard to the ARIES report, but which, as I said, I believe, you know, are bigger than ARIES, which is why I wanted to address them in a more global way. <clears throat> so there are actually two different points uh, that are fairly, you know, independent from one another. Uh, the first one I think is easier. And by the way, in case you haven't seen it, uh, Brian sent one of his long email <laughs> to the TSC list where he addressed uh, these points from his point of view. And uh, it's an interesting read. Um, the first one, I think, you know, uh, so let's talk about this first part, which is the situation of Aries, which, you know, they feel like the exit criteria for incubation seem to be at odd with the, the, the structure of the ARIES project where, as we heard earlier from Stephen, they, they have actually different projects within ARIES itself. And each project is, I mean, all the projects are not the same level of maturity. And uh, so they, they are not sure how to handle this situation. So uh, I don't mean to, you know, respond to, to answer for the, the, the whole TSC obviously, but let me start by saying, we need to be very clear, and I know it's not, it's not necessarily intuitive, but the status, as we've said repeatedly in the past, when we're discussing the exit criteria actually uh, from incubation is that, you know, the status of the project has to do with the maturity of the project and the way the community is organized and not the maturity of the product. And so that's absolutely key. So when I hear Steven said earlier, well, some parts, you know, some projects within areas are not anywhere as mature as others. Uh, I'm like, well, the fact that they are not ready for production is irrelevant to, to this question as whether the project, you know, is entitled to, to be moved to active status. So we need to be, uh, to be, you know, clear on that aspect and hopefully, you know, I mean, as you probably all know, we are discussing badges. And uh, if we have time, we could talk about this, although I'm not sure we'll have time today. Uh, but there is, you know, a great proposal Dano put together on uh, badging. And uh, we may, you know, eventually move away from this status altogether. And, uh, but I don't know that it will help in this regard for that matter. But so I'd like to hear from others, you know, how they feel about this situation, you know, of Aries and, and more generally speaking, you know, say a project, um, you know, having different projects within itself and, you know, pro at different levels. How do we handle that from a TSC point of view? Do we focus on, you know, well, they have at least one project that qualifies, therefore we can uh, essentially say, yes, this project, you know, can move to active status, or do we say, no, every one of them has to. I, I, I'll, I'll share one more piece before giving the microphone, is that, you know, if I think of fabric in which I'm involved, you know, it's pretty clear that we've added other sub projects, you know, there are repositories that get started because we want to develop a, a new, new path, new tools or whatever, and clearly, at least for a while, those can be fairly experimental and nowhere near 
the same level as the rest. And I don't think we should say, oh, the whole project is no longer qualifying as active status because now they have one of the sub projects that is completely at a different level of maturity. So based on that, I feel like it would be unfair to say a project like Aries where there is this situation, you know, it stops them from moving in, out of incubation. So let's just put it, me put that, um, that, let's get to the queue. So Arun first, I think. Hey, um, so I want to understand the question first here. So Aries is, I understand Aries is a little different from rest of the projects over there. Um, so can we define what project or sub project means with respect to Aries and we'll take it up from there. For example, uh, okay, let me let me give some context or why I'm asking this question. So let's say if Aries is going to be a framework which is going to provide um, uh, all those capabilities which we which we see in the agents, right? The current maybe it's in Python or the Go agent which is implemented over there. And if it really follows a spec, then we can the, the project is called as some any it could be implemented in any language of choice could be using any underlying uh, DLT for that matter. As long as it follows this spec, then we define that as a project under Aries. And is that how we are defining a project over here or how are we categorizing or how are we defining a project or a sub project? And it All comes right, so let, let me just say, I, I see Nathan is on the queue next. So that's perfect because I think Nathan can probably address that point. But before we get there, I do want to highlight again, you know, we have had many discussions about, you know, this notion of projects, sub projects, and whether we should recognize this and all. And we've said, you know, for better and for worse, we said we're not getting into the business of how each project gets organized. If they have sub projects, that's their business. From a TSC point of view, we look at them globally as one project. So, you know, obviously in this case, it raises an interesting question, which maybe kind of makes that less so obvious but that's what i think we are facing nathan please um i think that the there's kind of uh, two sides to this um discussion that i find really interesting the first is we want projects that have lots of diversity we want to let lots of people come participate and write code the way that they want to scratch their own itches so so to speak um and so allowing lots of people to do things in different ways and try lots of different things, even if not everyone in the community agrees, um, is kind of part of the premise of, in particular, how Aries has been organized. Um, and that has led to more diversity within the project and a lot more contribution. Um, and the other side of this coin is we want the project to have a cohesive theme. We want everyone to be working together on the core use cases. And that's where we have the Aries interoperability profiles and we test against a common spec and we try to enforce, at least to some extent, uh, interoperability, at least in that generalized sense. And this leaves us with this kind of interesting question of how much the same do all the frameworks need to be? Um, how much diversity is okay? And how much do we all need to be doing exactly the same thing? And we want to create a situation where people can try out a lot of stuff and, and people can come and participate the way they want to, because um, that helps grow the community, that helps make it more useful. Um, and at the same time, we want to have some back pressure that says, you know, you, you need to, to come conform and be part of what's going on in, in general. Um, and so uh, this is kind of that same struggle as Arno describes of what's the sub project, what's its own project, how much do we push and force that conformity versus how much do we give people some space to try something new that might prove itself to be much better than what the rest of the community is thinking currently. All right, so Arun, does that help? I'm not sure, but that's it, it, where it, we are. It, it does answer part of my question and, and, and those, uh, I still feel so, I, I saw a chart, I'm seeing chart as well. So where Tracy is pointing out that we should really treat Aries as a set of SDKs working. Uh, I mean, it's a project where we have different SDKs written. So um, on, on that understanding, right? So in, when we have to consider the project as um, mature in this case, for example, 
if if I have to again take up example of fabric for that matter, we we know fabric has uh, the the core components which code is available, and then we we judge it based on those things, those parameters, and then there are SDKs available in multiple uh, languages which all confront or follow the similar approach, or at least it has those agreement points saying that as long as SDK implements these features A, B, and C we say it is compliant with fabric so it's a sub project of it. it so just because fabric is uh, in, in a maturity state doesn't mean the new sdk has to start with the same state so similarly i'm still unable to understand um, the project and the sub project division within aries and since it is completely distributed in the sense that each um, each implementation can have its own spec uh, so that's we, we still need a common grounds on which to consider a project to be mature. For example, are we considering a Python implementation of Aries to be mature? If if so, then what are those parameters? Can we can we list them down so that uh, let's say the Go framework gets more stabilized? Can we compare it with this? So what are those points which what are the points which we need to uh, map it against? How we define them? Um, so could I could I uh, respond? I put my hand up. I'm not sure if Nathan was there, but um, I'd like to no, respond. I think he forgot to put his okay. hand down. So go ahead, Stephen. Okay. Um, so two things. Um, one is just a, a a note about what was just said, which was parts sub projects use different specs. Um, that is not the case. Um, the core of the project is defining. Uh, the the specs, the RFCs, and then having them all follow them. Um, different projects have gone with different versions of the specs at times. And so that doesn't enable interoperability at that time, but all are progressing on the same specs in the same direction. So that's not an issue. Um, <clears throat> a very practical impact of having the word incubation on Aries is that people come to the uh, Hyperledger community knowing about Indy and Aries, and they look at Indy and say, oh, that's active, whereas Aries is incubation. So I'm going to just go to Indy because it's obviously more mature. And <laughs> the problem that creates is it's a, they are apples to apples, of course. They're two different things. One is built on the other, um, but it causes a derailment and a, uh, a misunderstanding in the community uh, of, of people arriving. Um, they go to the wrong place, they do the wrong things, they spend their um, time doing different stuff and it causes problems. So that's um, the very practical side of why I'd like to, you know, one reason why I, I've been pushing for a while to A, adjust the readmes that, that people arrive to. So we've done that, um, but we really haven't picked up this idea of, of transitioning from incubation because we have different thoughts of, of what does that mean, different understandings. And that's what I'm trying to surface here. If, if the answer is just, we need to put an application in as an ARIES project um, to the TSC to say, hey, we should be, at, we should be um, marked as active. Um, we can take that as the action and go forward. So I know that uh, offline, I mean, we had a bit of an email exchange and Rai pointed you to the process to, yeah, yeah. To, to do just that. And I, yeah. I can only encourage you to really have a close look at this and do the, you know, go through the exercise of saying, okay, you know, where do we fail the exit criteria? And, yeah. uh, and, you know, and, and that's where the, you know, the analogy with fabric um, doesn't quite work because fabric is a, you know, it has a single artifact essentially that it's producing now there's a bunch of other projects and and other components to it that is um that is uh um that make up the entire community and so on but but fabric itself is the thing the artifact that gets released um it has a number a single number on it and so on aries is not like that at all aries framework go has uh versioning aries um Cloud Agent Python has um, no, a versioning, and that's where we've struggled to, you know, even think about that. But your point is absolutely well taken, which is although we are aware of it and we've at, at a superficial level read through the criteria, 
and and and, and struggled with it. Uh, I think the answer is we just go through it in detail and just say we're going to pick the most mature framework or two frameworks and answer it for those and yes. and, and and submit. I think that's, that's exactly what you're saying. What I, yeah, that's exactly what I was going to advise you to do because mm -hmm. I think it is doing, and you, you you explained it well earlier, you know, it's clearly doing a disservice to those, you know, projects that are within Aries, uh, the Aries umbrella to not be seen as, you know, in the right status. So, and, you know, for better and for worse, the current process we have for this status, you know, goes to a review by the TSC and it yeah. has its own flaws, but at the same time, it does provide for you know room for discussions, and I think in this case you can definitely make a case for why it should be considered you know uh, uh, qualifying for the, yeah. for the 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 change of status. So I uh, I highly encourage you to look into it. So with this being said, I mean we only have so much time, so I would like to switch to the next question that was also raised as part of the report and we heard Stephen touch on that aspect, you know he talks about the standards or the specifications they are developing as part of ARIES and it raises the question about, you know, does that have its place within Hyperledger and is that, you know, the right place? And if you've read the email from Brian, he makes it pretty clear, you know, there, that the initial intent was clearly not to have, I want to say standards work, right? Uh, specification development work happening in Hyperledger and leave that to other organizations. And one of the reasons is definitely a legal uh, uh, reason because, um, standards work basically requires a patent policy and, and a different legal framework, let's say, than what we have for open source. And if you start developing standards within the framework for open source, you might actually encounter issues down the line. And so the, the intent was, well, we're not going to get into this. There's plenty of other organizations that are already work in standards. And so there's no reason we should do that here. Now, I know that Aries actually does it. And so that raises the question and, you know, I give them credit for bringing it up to the TSC, say, okay, how, how do we deal with this, you know? And so obviously, I don't know that we necessarily want to tell them, no, stop doing this, <laughs> go away and do that somewhere else. But uh, we, this is a real issue we have to discuss. So I don't know, uh, yeah, Sam? Um, so some additional commentary on this, and this is actually a conversation I had a bit ago with, with Brian. We have, we have multiple forms of this happening. And the notable uh, thing to bring up here is, is the DIDCOM effort that is now a working group in the Decentralized Identity Foundation. And that came about as a result of interest outside of the ARIES community in using um, the, the DIDCOM standard, and, and we ran into this issue where, um, you know, if we're defining interfaces for use with, within ARIES projects, it's not an issue. Um, if, we're, if we're trying to go broad from that perspective, then it really needs to find another home. So this gets a little weird in the sense that there are times where we have talked about interfaces within ARIES projects, and then there's actually been a fair amount of interest for people that want to use those outside, and, and that's okay, but, but it starts to get into that weird area um, where we're sort of seeking homes for things. And so um, I, I just wanted to highlight that we have these two forms now. We have, we have discussion that's happened just entirely within the ARIES community so far, and, and, and pieces of it that have actually moved out into a different organization um, and it, with those conversations happening there. So I don't know that that gives us an answer, uh, but it's a little more color to the, to the, uh, to the situation. Well, I, I want to add one more thing to that, and that is when standards are not implementation driven, they tend to get very disconnected from reality. And one thing that we found out of the stuff that's come out of the ARIES community is it's much more readily codable and usable um, than a lot of the stuff we're seeing out of the other organizations where it's not attached to any implementation effort. So the closer we can get to the implementers, the better. That's not to say that it has to happen inside of Hyperledger or inside of ARIES per se, but it means that that um, 
divorcing the standards work from the coding project has had a lot of uh, symptoms of dysfunction in the past. Yeah, no, I can I, totally see how that would be. Dave. Yeah, I had a quick question for Sam, um, Kern, that uh, what happens if you do move the DIDCOM stuff out of Aries and a bunch of non Aries people come in and start moving it in directions that is contrary to the Aries, you know, mission, direction, whatever? I mean, are you prepared for that kind of thing? I mean, that's so, a really important question. So it is. Uh, and so let me tell you what's happened and what could happen, uh, because I think both are relevant. What has happened is that the experience of the Aries community has proved invaluable in the diff effort of there are a bunch of Aries community members there involved. Um, and there's, it's been really nice to Nathan's point to say in our experience in what we're calling Didcom V1, which was, you know, grown inside of Aries. Uh, this is true, you know, turned to be profoundly true. And we, we haven't ever really received pushback about the things that the Aries community has learned. I, I have to say, as, as a note, I'm very pleased with the direction that, that the effort is, is going in that working group. And, uh, and, and I, I see good things coming in the future. To the second point of you know, the piece of your question, if that effort sprouted legs and walked off in a totally unanticipated direction and the end result was something that was found not to meet the needs of the Aries community the Aries community has no actual obligation to use the output of that new effort um we, one of the things that we did on purpose is we 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 didn't want to stop the forward progress of the Aries community simply because a new effort had actually begun. Um, and that is true. We have continued to develop uh, things and move forward as an Aries community, um, though we anticipate and look forward to adopting DIDCOM V2 because it is going in a direction that meets the needs of the Aries community. So if a project sprouts wings and flies off, th there's actually no you know, the Aries community can say, well, that didn't work and that we can continue to do things within the Aries community to serve our own needs. Um, does that answer your question? Dave? Yes, sorry, trying to find the mute button. Um, yeah, that totally answers it. I guess the answer is if that happens, awesome. If it, if it uh, doesn't meet your needs, then you'll just make do, right? You'll do something else. Then I had a follow-up question. Have you guys considered the diff? I mean, it seems like the natural partner for standards to Hyperledger, right? It, it is. And this is an interesting conversation because it depends on what you mean. Uh, for example, the diff has a credentials working group. So uh, as DIDCOM v2 reaches uh, maturity, um, it, it would make sense that the the, the, that the credentials and claims working group over there would actually say, okay, hey, let's let's grab the credentials um, protocols that have been, uh, you know, uh, developed inside of Aries, and then let's use that as a foundation for the next thing um, that builds on top of that. Um, the the question about whether they actually want that as a work item or whether that's something that they desire is still open. Um, I think the problem that Stephen's getting to here is. Um, what what is the what does this process actually look like? Um, do we have to reevaluate these one by one as they come up, or is there some sort of like blanket understanding or thing that could apply to all of these, um, you know, different questions? Because there are other protocols, not just around credentials, but around uh, around like asset transfer and gathering signatures and all sorts right. of other things that that could expand into this. And so. While I think we have maybe a good handle on like one or two of these things, I think the broader question remains. And part of what could happen here is that we end up with a group, perhaps at the diff, that would not be an inappropriate place, um, that, that actually takes over the coordination of these protocols, generally speaking, which, which would leave the Aries community to focus on which ones we're going to target from our code bases. Um, yeah, and, and implement them. And implement them. That's that's already true. Like the Aries interoperability profile version two that we're working on actually has external pointers to things developed elsewhere. For example, the uh, the the credential uh, manifest format at work at the diff is a, is one example of that with the same organization. That um, and so it's not it's not a bad thing to have the the Aries folks pick an external thing and say that is a thing that we're going to you know include into the software development of our projects. 
So Sam, to take this out of the TSC context, um, it sounds like we probably should have at least one follow-up meeting to discuss the direction. Like it's almost like we need a free trade agreement and framework for how to move stuff from Hyperledger to Diff, you know, when it becomes too specky, right? And um, I don't want to take up all the rest of the TSC time. Um, so maybe I'll follow up with you and we'll have a bigger uh conversation because this you know, this is starting to move into community architect land right like we need to have a bigger discussion with more people well i think that's kind doing. of the question uh, at the heart of this uh, uh, you know to me i mean it's like well i would hate for us to say guys you can't do this you need to stop it go do the somewhere this somewhere else so my inclination is to say no keep doing this and we should have whoever, maybe it's uh, Andy Abdegrove or, you know, somebody from the Linux Foundation look into what we need to make that safe, so to speak, right? So that from a legal point of view, we have covered all the bases and that eventually, and let's be clear, it's not about developing a standard per se, because we're not going to declare we're doing standards, but we can develop specifications, the nuances subtle, subtle but important and that eventually those specs could be submitted elsewhere for you know standardization like directory c or, or other places but we want not to have those specs be tainted in any way that will make it difficult for organizations like this to take that work over and so i think that's really the the what's i think we you know we should look into I, I, and, and maybe sometimes it goes to diff, maybe it goes to elsewhere. That to me is not really the issue. And I'm happy to leave it to the community to, to figure out when they feel like, okay, we should bring it up to a different venue. But I feel like, you know, because they are working on the code, as we've heard, they like to write the spec at the same time. And I've been there, I could totally relate to this. You know, it's much nicer to develop your specs at the same time as you're doing implementation and can doing that feedback loop to make sure it makes sense and it's not just a piece of paper. Uh, and and so I, I think they are inclined to keep doing this. So I would hate stopping it. I would again, you know, prefer that we focus on making sure they have the right framework to to do this. Is there anyone else? Nathan, you still have your hand up. I don't know if it's from before. Or if... No, no, this is, I, I re-raised my hand. Um, I don't wanna solve with policy what we can solve with patients. Um, in particular, it took a long time to convince the broader community of kind of this agent interaction model and that it wasn't really just a REST API and we could move on. Um, and to get the spec right, I think um, Arno's intuition of we've got to let, let the organic process work and we need to put whatever guardrails we need in place in order to make that work. Um, and uh, that includes saying just anytime something looks specky, there's a diff repository right here for you and they've, they've agreed that we can just have that sandbox kind of as a, a permanent fixture of the project. Um, we're not, I think, as picky about how that has to happen, only that there is a, a, a positive forum where it's safe to, to, to make sure it happens. It's not that easy though, Nathan, right? Because to put stuff into the diff, the contributors have to sign a contributor agreement and all oh, that. Oh, don't, don't I know it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I just don't want to gloss over some details. It's not that simple, but yeah, it could be. It's just, yeah, there's extra roadblocks. I, I, I agree with you, Dave, but this problem has been solved many times and people like Andy Abdegrove make a living out of solving these problems. So yeah. I don't want us to just say, oh, we, we can't do this. Uh, I think, uh, you know, we, we that wasn't my point. That wasn't my point. I just didn't want to gloss over details for people here who haven't, you know, who haven't been in the nuts and bolts of the, these kinds of things in the past. So oh, to your point, I appreciate that. so Sam. to your point, Dave, I think that we can, um, I think that one of the things that Hyperledger could do to assist this in the healthy forward movement of communities is actually um, develop a process or figure out the right tooling in, in order to make that process of signing agreements, et cetera, uh, laid out so that this is easier to do in the future when it occurs. So 
uh, there's in a multi-organizational scenario, there's different pieces that different organizations do. And I think that the diff has actually learned a lot about how to like sort of gain a work item um, or, or, or a working group around something specific. And I think that one of the things that Hyperledger could do is, is make it easier for other organizations to build processes off of things that were born inside of Hyperledger um, in order to avoid the complexities that come with, with being standards creation based. Um, I don't know exactly what that answer is, but we've we've been through this once, and I think that uh, that as we sort of pay attention to this, it might be something that Hyperledger could actually do is 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 basically sort of per, uh, have a known uh, ramp to that process, so that we it is clear what has to happen, and we know which crank to turn and uh, and, yeah. and to make that happen. That's a really great suggestion. It's like we could build the recipe, so next time we see this, like oh, we know what this is here's the recipe for how to deal with it. Right, which means like when that. someone comes and says, hey, we want to build standards off of this Hyperledger thing, you're like, great, turn this crank and, and yeah. out pops the, the, uh, a foundation for you to build upon. Yeah, that's actually a really good idea. Good suggestion, thanks. Okay, so I've only heard kind of supportive uh, statements. I wanted to ask the TSC, those who, the many who have been silent today, that, you know, whether anybody has, you know, objection or, uh, you know, uh, feels, you know, unsure about this direction we're suggesting. I, I, because otherwise I would say that, you know, for me, the outcome of this discussion is to ask the staff to look into what it would take to, you know, set up the right legal framework for this kind of work to happen safely. And again, I wouldn't pull talk. I mean, I wouldn't say that this is standards development we can call it like maybe pre-standard development or something like this. There's wiggle room there, but you know we have to be careful. Those words are really loaded. <laughs> yeah, and the problem is, is that every open source project hopes to develop, hopes to become the standard, right? So we also have to sort of tamp down the aspirations of every new little project who thinks this is going to be the global standard in X, right? Yeah, I think you'd have to difference with one specific implementation and like interfaces protocols that you want others to implement. Yeah, I get that. I get that. All right, guys, we're out of time. So we're going to close on this. I haven't seen anybody raise their hand to my call for objections or concerns, expression of concern. So I take this as an approval and um, we'll uh, discuss this further with the staff and uh, see what Brian says. So with that said, uh, let me close the call. Thank everybody for joining us today and we'll talk again next week.